Born on May 8, 1998, in San Francisco, California, Molly Cecilia Tibbetts was the daughter of Rob and Laura Tibbetts. Following her parents' divorce when she was in the second grade, Molly, alongside her mother and siblings, moved to Iowa, marking a new chapter in their lives. Despite the geographical distance, her father Rob kept a strong and loving relationship with Molly and her siblings, showing that family bonds can withstand even the toughest changes. Molly settled in Brooklyn, Iowa, a charming town located about 70 miles east of Des Moines. Her academic journey led her to the University of Iowa, where she was working toward a degree in psychology. Beyond her studies, Molly devoted her time to working at a day camp for children at the Grinnell Regional Medical Center, demonstrating her passion for helping others from a young age. She was looking forward to starting her sophomore year filled with plans and aspirations for the future. However, on July 19, 2018, the community's peace was shattered when Molly, then 20, did not show up for her job at a daycare center in Brooklyn, Iowa. Known for her reliability, her absence raised immediate concerns. Dalton Jack, her boyfriend, found himself in a panic as his attempts to reach her by phone were met with an unending ring and voicemail. The unsettling silence prompted Dalton to alert the authorities as it became clear that no one had seen Molly that day. The last communication anyone had with Molly was the evening before her disappearance, leaving her loved ones clinging to hope for her safe return. Dalton, after failed attempts to contact Molly through calls that went straight to voicemail, realized that neither Molly's family nor her close friends had any knowledge of her whereabouts that day and alerted the authorities about her missing status. In the midst of their investigation, police learned from Dalton that Molly had been residing at the home he shared with his brother Blake, taking care of their dogs while the brothers were out of town for work. This arrangement placed Molly alone in the house during the week of her disappearance. Dalton's last known interaction with Molly was through a Snapchat message he received at 10.30 p.m. on July 18th, as he spent the evening in his hotel room. Further inquiries into Molly's activities before her disappearance revealed that she had embarked on an evening jog along a rural road near Brooklyn on July 18th. This piece of information was corroborated by Christina Stewart, an acquaintance of Molly's, who reported seeing her running around at 7.45 p.m. that evening, providing a crucial time frame for the investigation. This led the police to scour the area for surveillance footage that could provide further clues. Authorities and volunteers rallied together in a vast search operation that spanned several weeks, combing through the area but finding no trace of Molly. A breakthrough came when the police accessed CCTV footage from the area of Molly's run. The video not only confirmed Molly's presence but also highlighted a particular vehicle's suspicious behavior, circling back and passing her again offering a new lead in the investigation. This discovery was part of an exhaustive effort by friends, family, and law enforcement to piece together Molly's last known movements in the hope of finding her. Christian Bahena Rivera, an undocumented migrant from Mexico who had been employed under a false name at Yarrabee Farms, a dairy farm close to where Molly Tibbetts went missing, became a key figure in the investigation following the analysis of surveillance footage. This footage, taken from a homeowner's security camera, showed Rivera driving by Molly in his Chevy Malibu on the day of her disappearance. Initially, Rivera denied any involvement or even citing Molly that day. However, under thorough interrogation, his story changed dramatically. Rivera confessed to noticing Molly while driving, attracted by her appearance, which led him to circle back. His attempt to approach her escalated quickly when Molly threatened to call the police, prompting Rivera to admit to a loss of memory due to anger. This blackout, as described by him, ended with him finding Molly and buddied in his car. Rivera then led the police to a secluded cornfield in Brooklyn, Iowa, where he had hidden Molly's body, marked by her recognizable running shoes peeking out from under the leaves and corn stalks. The discovery of Molly's body led to an autopsy, which concluded she had been brutally stabbed multiple times. Rivera was charged with first degree. Despite leading authorities to Molly's remains, he pleaded not guilty to the charges. The prosecution faced the challenge of bridging the gap in Rivera's account from the altercation to Molly's death, contending that the only explanation for the bloodied scene Rivera awoke to in his car was that he was responsible for her murder. They aimed to convince the jury of Rivera's sole culpability in this tragic event, underscoring that no other individuals were implicated in Molly's murder. In presenting their case against Christian, the prosecution focused on a trio of key elements designed to solidify their accusation of the pivotal evidence included surveillance video that showed Rivera's vehicle in proximity to Molly as she embarked on her jogging route. 
Additionally, Rivera's own admissions during police interrogation became central to the case, particularly his confession to leading law enforcement to where he had hidden Molly's remains. A critical piece of forensic evidence was the discovery of Molly's DNA within Rivera's vehicle, further linking him to the crime. The Pauchik County attorney emphasized to the jury the coherence of this evidence, arguing that it conclusively pointed to Rivera's guilt in the tragic death. The narrative constructed by the prosecution painted a chilling timeline, Molly setting out for a run on the evening of July 18th and never returning, leading to the grim discovery of her body a month later in an advanced state of decomposition. Throughout the trial, emotional testimony was provided by Dalton, who shared memories of Molly as a vibrant and affectionate person, deeply cherished by those who knew her. Dalton recounted their three-year relationship, detailing his whereabouts on the day Molly vanished. He was working on a bridge construction project in Dubuque, over 140 miles from Brooklyn, and had spent the evening after work, socializing with colleagues, confirming his alibi of not being in Brooklyn that night. The prosecution's narrative continued with Rivera's arrest and his subsequent admissions. He described encountering Molly during her run, attracted to her, and decided to follow her. His attempt to engage her led to a fatal altercation after Molly threatened to call the police, escalating the situation to violence. Rivera claimed a blackout during the confrontation, a gap in memory that ended with the tragic outcome of Molly's death. This sequence of events, as laid out by the prosecution, aimed to provide the jury with a comprehensive view of the evidence pointing unequivocally to Rivera as the perpetrator of this heinous crime. Rivera's subsequent memories led him to a harrowing scene, driving with Molly Tibbetts' soaked body in his truck. Court testimonies painted a vivid picture of the events that followed, detailing how Rivera transported Molly to a secluded cornfield, carefully placed her body at the site, and concealed it with corn stalks. The prosecution proposed to the jury that the manner of Molly's death suggested a sexual motive, highlighting the state of her body, found only in socks and a sports bra, with her legs positioned in a manner that could indicate an assault. The jury learned of the extensive injuries Molly suffered, as the autopsy reported, she endured 7 to 12 wounds across her chest, ribs, neck and skull, all leading to her demise from sharp force injuries. Further cementing Rivera's connection to the crime, the prosecution introduced evidence of Molly's DNA found in Rivera's truck, notably on bloodstains located on the rubber seal and liner of the trunk, urging the jury to view the evidence in its entirety as incontrovertible proof of Rivera's guilt. In response, the defense offered a contrasting narrative, portraying Rivera as a hard-working immigrant who came to the United States illegally as a teenager, seeking a better life. His attorney, Jennifer Fries, criticized the police investigation as hastily concluded, arguing for justice not only for Molly's family, but for Rivera as well. The defense suggested that Rivera was coerced into a false confession, influenced by prolonged police interrogation following a 12-hour work shift, and described him as compliant to the point of acquiescence under pressure. The defense strategy also involved casting doubt on Dalton, suggesting his imperfections and temper issues could point to another narrative. They highlighted Dalton's admission of infidelity and his acknowledged temper, suggesting unresolved issues between him and Molly, particularly around his cheating, which Molly discovered just days before her disappearance. They also pointed to Rivera's history of non-violence and the intense interrogation conditions under which he confessed, suggesting that his admission was coerced and not a true account of events. The turning point in Rivera's defense came when he took the stand, offering a radically different version of events involving two masked men who allegedly orchestrated the crime and forced his participation under threat. This narrative introduced the possibility of other suspects and complicated the case with claims of external coercion. The defense's forensic consultant addressed the DNA evidence found in Rivera's vehicle, acknowledging Molly's presence, but also noting unidentified DNA, which added layers of ambiguity to the case. Testimony from Iris Gamboa, Rivera's ex-partner, aimed to humanize him further, portraying him as a responsible father and a non-violent individual, contradicting the image of a murderer. After extensive deliberations, the jury convicted Rivera of first-degree murder, a verdict that came after considering all evidence, including the initial confession, forensic data, and the defense's alternative theories. Molly's mother, Laura Calderwood, provided a poignant victim impact statement that served not only as a tribute to Molly's life, but also as a condemnation of the irreversible harm caused by Rivera's actions. Her statement, filled with personal loss and the shattering of familial dreams, painted a vivid picture of the ripple effects of violence, impacting not just the immediate victim, but the generations to come. 
The case's closure with Rivera's sentencing leaves a community in mourning and a family forever altered. Share your thoughts on this case in the comments below. Your insights are valuable to us, but remember to remain respectful to the victim and her family and friends. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to stay updated with our weekly releases. Look after yourself and those close to you. Thanks for watching.